And that's what we believe that the Lord is saying to us today and during this 40 days of prayers, to come to him and lay our needs down before him. I want to welcome you to week three. And it's been an incredible week, uh, preparation and getting ready for what God wants to say to you. And I decided today to get rid of the notes and just tailor this talk to you because I'm going to tell you a story that kind of lasts a while. It has a lot of parts to it. It's in Genesis chapter 38 to 45. And uh, so it's going to come out a little differently than it's come out in the 9 and the 10 o'clock service. But what I know is this. God is up to something good today. And wherever you find yourself in the scale of life from A to Z, He's got a message for you that will bring you hope. Because here's what I know. When, when you understand how good God is and that he's always with you, you'll always pray. You won't have a problem with prayer. But what happens is circumstances in our life become negative. We pray for a while, and what we pray for doesn't happen. And we think a delay means denial. Denial. When delay never means denial, it just means not yet. Sometimes God's at work in ways we can't see. And the story of Joseph illustrates that better than any story in the Bible. And we're going to walk you through it. The guy named Joseph was the son of Jacob. He was the 11th son, and he was born to Jacob in his old age. And for whatever reason, Jacob decided to make him his favorite. He gave Joseph a coat of many colors. I remember when I was in in, uh, Sunday school. We read about this story, and I would color, you know, the coat of many colors. And it was a fancy coat, and the other brothers didn't like it that he got this special robe. In fact, they hated him for it, and they couldn't say anything nice because of the preferential treatment given to their brother. Now, all of us have families and all of us have a measure of dysfunction, but there wasn't a whole, your family's got nothing on this family, okay? I I guarantee you, this is one of the more dysfunctional families in the Bible, and what's really cool is the guy named Jacob, his name would become Israel, and these 11 plus one knuckle-headed sons would actually be the 12 tribes of Israel that we hear about in the Bible. Crazy, isn't it? How, How God will use this dysfunctional family a little bit like the church. (laughs) We put the fun in dysfunctional every day right here at Highland Park. And uh, so let me tell you about it. One day they were out and Joseph decides to lay on this dream that he had to his brothers. Joseph was a lot of things, but one of them was he wasn't very bright when he talked. And as a teenager, we all, we've, we've all said things we wish we hadn't said. And Joseph said, hey brothers, hey guys, listen, I had a dream. We were out, and we were collecting wheat into sheaves, and those are like bundles that are like this, like, right? So my sheaf stood up, and yours all bowed down to me. I wonder what that means. And his brother said, Joseph, you must be on crack if you think we're going to bow down to you anytime. They didn't say crack because they didn't have crack then, but you can imagine <laughs> that would be the lingo if used today. I'm not bowing down. And oh, he said, well, wait, there's more. I had one other dream. The sun and the moon and the 11 stars all bowed down to my feet. Isn't that cool? And they were angry at him, but his father wondered what it all meant. Because these are pretty strong dreams, and they said basically the same thing. So one day they were out in the fields, and Joseph was back in the house, and he wanted to go out to his brothers and be a big boy, you know, and so he goes out to where they're working in the fields and they see him coming, and the hatred they feel for him is extreme. It's not just like, we don't like our brother, it's like we hate our brother, and we wanna see him hurt. The kind of evil that exists in our world everywhere happened in this home. So they see him coming, and they, they get the idea, let's kill him, and let's tell dad that a wild animal got him. But one of the brothers intervened and said, no, let's don't do that wicked thing. If we do anything, let's just sell him. There was a group of camels down that way. They were slave traders from Egypt. Let's sell him to the slave traders and then let fate take him wherever he may go. Their plan for him was to be rid of him for good. Joseph, the dreamer, was handed off to slave traders, taken to Egypt. They lived up north in Canaan, went to Egypt, 
had to learn a foreign language. He was thrust into the home of a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar was a, was a governor. He was an important guy in Pharaoh's uh, uh, place. See, Egypt at this time in history was one of the most prominent nations on the planet. They had a lot of power ruled over by Pharaoh. And so Potiphar worked for Pharaoh, pretty good job. And he, he, he saw Joseph and apparently he was able to see a good thing right off the bat. Because it didn't take Joseph long to become the head of the whole household. In fact, the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph in slavery, in a place where he didn't belong, in a place that he had no desire to ever be. He found himself doing the right thing. You say, well, how did Joseph not give up on God? I mean, this, this is the time things are looking pretty bleak. If, and just get, if you would, just for a minute, get in Joseph's head for a minute. I, I, I can't because I've got three brothers and they're all good to me. I can't imagine them taking me from my home and taking me across the world and dropping me. I can't. But that's what Joseph felt, yet he didn't give up on God. And he, he, he acted like someone who was absolutely confident that God was good and that he was with him. That's how he was able to behave that way. So he, he did his job well. And the Bible says that Potiphar was blessed because Joseph was his headmaster, if you will, taking care of all the household stuff. So Potiphar loved it. He didn't have to work. But Potiphar's wife noticed Joseph. Apparently, Joseph was well-built and handsome to boot. So his brothers not only hated him because he got everything from dad, the dude was... He was rocking a good body, and he was nice looking. He was Tim Tebow, you know, if you will. I, just kind of that kind of guy, right? So if you, because it's a lot of high character stuff. So Potiphar's wife does what she shouldn't have done. She says, Joseph, come and lie with me. Now, kids, ask what your parent, ask your parents later what that means. But just ask them. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, but no, there, there was there was some sexual tension there put yourself in Joseph's shoes you've been sold into slavery there's no guarantee you're ever going to have a wife you don't have control over any circumstance here's an opportunity that presents itself now you say well she was probably less than attractive we don't know that we don't know what she was and here's what Joseph says he says uh no I would not dishonor my master. He's placed me in charge of my home. I have everything under his care. The only thing I can't touch is you. I won't dishonor my master. And I'm not going to dishonor God. Wow. You know what integrity is? Doing the right thing when nobody's looking. And Joseph seemed to have this mastered, even though he didn't have a long lifespan. He didn't even have a, an opportunity to, to display it. He just learned integrity day by day by day. And he made this decision, I'm not going to dishonor God in that way. And so day after day, Potiphar's wife says, come on, Joseph, come on, nobody's looking. So that temptation was after him every single day for just a random hookup. Until one day, there was nobody in the house. All the servants were out in the field. Nobody would have known. And she says, Joseph, come and be with me. And Joseph says, absolutely not. He starts running the moment she says, come here. You know, the Bible is real clear about what to do with sexual temptation, right? You run. If you sit around and talk about it and think about it, you're done. So he ran, and the woman grabbed his coat as he's on the way out the door, and she is hacked off. This slave has said no to her one too many times, so she's going to get even. In fact, she did. She told her husband, look, this is Joseph's coat. He came to my bedroom, and he tried to rape me, and I got his coat to prove it, and you need to get rid of this dog. And the, the husband, Potiphar, was so enraged at Joseph, even though he had done a great job, he didn't, want, he didn't like what he had done to his wife, so he threw him in prison. And an interesting twist happens right about here. The Bible says, but Joseph was with him there too. 
The Lord was with Joseph in the prison too. You get that? The Lord was with him the whole time. He never left him. And before long, the Bible says the jailer put Joseph in charge of everything that went on in the jail. Everything that happened in the prison, he was in charge of. And so just like he had done in the house of Potiphar, he does in prison. Because Joseph begins to act like somebody who's absolutely confident that God is good and that he is with him. Somewhere in there, and that, that Joseph knew he had a dream. A lot of you have had a dream, right? And then life interrupts your dream. You quit praying, you quit thinking about it, you think, well, there's no way I could ever get there. But somehow Joseph was able to remain faithful because he had these two things in his head. God is good, and he is with me. And if God is good, and he is with me, he is not done with me. That's big. You've got to hang on to that. Because right now, some of you, in the, you're in the middle of this, the painful part of your life, the most painful part to date. And what I know is that all of us are in one of three places. We, we're either headed into pain, we're in pain, or we're headed out of pain. Did you know that? That, that, that just kind of narrows it down. It comes as a part of living in this fallen world. And so the Lord is with Joseph in prison. See, God may seem silent, but he's never absent. He's never absent. This story will give you the A to Z. Joseph is about letter M in his journey. He, he was taken away probably between 15 and 17 years old, a journey that wouldn't end until he was about 30 to when he finally got some kind of justice. So he goes into prison, and he behaves as though he were absolutely confident that God was good, and he was with them. And he runs into a couple of guys that just get tossed into prison. They're former officials in Pharaoh's court, the cupbearer and the baker. They were important people, but they hacked off the wrong guy. And they got sent to prison with Joseph. And they'd been in, in there some time. And both of them, on the same night, had a dream. And so they're talking about their dream because there's nothing else to do in prison but talk. And so they're talking to each other. And, and they said to Joseph, hey, hey, we've got a dream. And he goes, you know what? I don't know what to do with your dream other than I know that God does. And interpreting dreams is God's business. What do you got? And so they tell him the dream. And it's really cool. They, they, their, their dreams were similar, but they weren't all, there was like a good story, bad story. The baker tells him the dream, and, the, and Joseph said, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but in three days you're going to get out, but it's not going to be good. In fact, you're going to be impaled on a stake and your head on a, you know, it's not going to be good. You're going to die in three days. How'd you like to give that interpretation to somebody, right? I think I'd want to dance around that, you know? <laughs> but he was able to hear from God and give him the truth because it happened just like Joseph said. But to the cupbearer, he says, hey, listen, you're, here's what your dream means. In three days, you're going to be restored to your old job. It's, it'll be like you never left. Pharaoh's going to take you back. You're going to do what you did. Here's what I ask you to do. Please have pity on me. Do me this favor. I didn't do anything to get put in jail, yet here I am. Will you tell Pharaoh about me? Will you remember me? And the cupbearer says, absolutely. If I get out in three days and things go like you say, I'll remember this and I will never forget. You know what happened? He got out and the Bible says he totally forgot Joseph. It's just like people, isn't it? You know, oh yeah, yeah. You ever, you ever been let down by somebody like Joseph was? You ever been lied about? like Potiphar's wife did? You ever had your kids lied about? Have you ever, you, ever, you, ever, you ever experienced that betrayal that comes when you do the right thing and you get beat over the head with it? How, how would you deal with it? How do you, how do you deal with it? Here's what I've, I've come to. It, what if, what if, you just, just throw this out there. What would I do if somebody like me were going through this circumstance that was absolutely confident that God is good and that he was with them? Or you can just personalize it. What if I truly believed that God was good and that he was with me? 
Now, if, if I truly believe that, I think I could get through some stuff, and I think I could see where Joseph's coming from because he languishes in prison for two more years. Two more years, he's stuck. He doesn't know the end of the story. He thinks he might be in there forever. But he gets his opportunity when Pharaoh has a couple of dreams himself. The king of the known universe on earth, right? And a lowly slave are about to meet up. So when Pharaoh tells all his officials, I've had two dreams and here they are, and he tells them the dreams, they're like, we don't know. We don't know what, we don't have any idea. They couldn't agree on an interpretation. They didn't know what was going down. So finally, the cupbearer said, oh, today I've been reminded of my failure. I, there's a guy in prison. He told me my dream and, and he, he nailed it, man. He got it just right. What he said would happen, happened to both me and the baker. So uh, he's in prison. His name's Joseph. He's just over there. The prison was right near the castle or wherever they lived, right? And so the Bible says they shaved him up, they cleaned him up, and here he goes. The flea of a dog of a person in prison who would languish there forever, about to be in the presence of God. And, and, and so Pharaoh tells him, hey, listen, I've heard some stuff about you, and I had a dream last night, and none of these idiots can tell me what it is. But I've heard tell that you understand how to interpret dreams. And Joseph said, listen, just think about this. He's been in prison. He's been in slavery, sold by his brothers. He's a nobody. And he's talking to Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh was worshiped as a god. He was not like a human being. He portrayed himself as a god. People would worship and bow down to Pharaoh. He's a god, little g, right? And here's what Joseph says to you. I can't do it. It's beyond my power to do this. But God will tell you. The God, capital G, right? Will tell you what these dreams mean. And I'm going to set your mind at ease. Now, how does a slave and a dungeon worker come with such confidence to talk to the most powerful man on the planet and say to you, I'm going to give you something. It's going to come from God Almighty. It's going to set your mind at ease. He said it with such confidence and bravado that it took Pharaoh aback a little bit. And then he says, tell me your dream, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh tells him the dream. And Joseph said, both of your dreams mean the same thing. Let me tell you what they mean. For seven years, we're going to have the best crops we've ever had. There's going to be grain running out our ears. In fact, we're going to think it's party time, like the prosperity will go forever. But God has decided this, and he's not going to change his mind, that on the seventh year, we're going to have a time of famine that will last for seven more years. The famine will be so bad that we'll forget about how good the good times were. In fact, we're going to think the famine will last forever. And then Joseph breaks into advisor to the king here's what you need to do here's what you need to do can you imagine you going up and telling donald trump whatever you i mean just can you imagine him calling you and say oh you you live in lakeland right best place on earth right come visit me tomorrow i'm coming to your house right you freak you out and then him sitting across the coffee table and you say hey donald fix your hair now here's what you need to do <laughs> right <laughs> how does he do his hair that way it never moves <laughs> other than the little breeze in the wind it's got it's a, such a glue down I don't get it it's cool <laughs> so <laughs> so Joseph steps up to the plate in the most important moment of his life that for the last 13 years have been preparing him the solitary confinement the time away from family, the time of total dependence on God. And he says to Pharaoh, here's what you need to do. Gather the grain over the next seven years. Take 20% from each family. Let's do a 20% taxation program. And take all the grain, put it in cities around our, our beautiful country here. And so when the famine hits, 
We've been saving 20% of our grain for seven years. When the famine does hit, we're going to be prepared, and we're going to have food to spare. In fact, we can sell it back to our own people. That's how good this plan is. When Pharaoh heard that, the Bible says his suggestions were well received. And he says, you know what, Joseph? You're the guy. You're the only one that could figure this dream out. You came to me with a plan that none of these guys with all these qualifications could give me. You're going to be the guy that's in charge. In fact, I'm going to make you second in command. There's nobody in all of Egypt that will have the rank that you will. Anything you say, they're going to have to do because that's what is important to me. I want to see you carry out this plan. And Joseph became the slave, the prisoner, and now the second in command. And if you work backwards and you think of the favor status and you think of the dream that he had, you're seeing how God weaved together all the difficulties to get him to where he was in that moment. Only God could have put that moment together. Only God could have orchestrated that release at such a time to give Joseph that one chance to change the future of a nation. You think, well, man, I don't know that I play that big a part in human history. You never know what God can do with somebody who is absolutely confident in his goodness and his presence. God could use you to do major things in this world if you'll trust him through the trivial, if you'll be faithful to him with your character when nobody is looking. God can pick you out of a crowd at any moment and elevate you to a place of influence. But here's what I know. He won't use a dirty vessel. He won't take from among the impure. He, he, he wants to purify you. And sometimes it's the pain of life that you, he uses in our life to humble us. Because we see in Joseph's life, after he does this program, after he, he takes the, the, the famine hits in year eight, and it spreads out not only just in Egypt, it goes north into Canaan where his family's from. So we're reintroduced to the 11 knuckleheads really 10 and a younger brother. They're in, in Canaan land and Jacob is still alive, but he's getting crotchety. And he sees his boys doing nothing because they've got no crops to tend. They've got their cows are dying. And he looks at him, he's saying, what are you guys doing? Get to work. Why are you looking at each other? Why don't you go down to Egypt and get us some grain? At least we can live for a while longer. If you don't, if you don't do something, we're gonna all die. Great word from the Lord from Jacob right there, right? You lazy kids, get out and do something. You've been living under my roof forever. You know, one of those guys, it was a dad moment, right? And so they go down to Egypt and they, they just happen to run in to Joseph, their brother, as they're looking for grain for their family. They have no idea it's Joseph. He's got a new beard. He's got all sorts of new duds on, you know, like he's second in command. So there's kind of robes they get in the big turban and all that, you know, probably jewels. He's got a new dialect. He speaks Egyptian. He doesn't speak Hebrew anymore. They have no idea they're talking to their brother they sold into slavery. And they're asking for grain. That's all they need. And so Joseph chats him up and he goes, hey, uh, so where are you from? Ah, we're from Canaan land. You up north. Uh, so uh, Where's your, do you have a dad? Is he well? Yeah, my, our dad's back home. What about brothers? You got any brothers? Yeah, we got another brother named Benjamin. He was the only one of our, our, our brothers that didn't come. The, us 10 were down here, but my dad really loves Benjamin and doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. So he's really protective of Benjamin. So our, uh, and then we have another brother who is no more. Oh, really? You got another brother who is no more? Huh, that's kind of strange. All right. And so the, he doesn't tell him who he is. And there's a whole story. You got to read it. It's, it's pretty long. But there was this one big night where he decided to reveal who he was to his brothers. The big reveal, you know. And he invites them to a dinner. And he seats them from the oldest to the youngest. And the brothers were astonished that he even knew how to seat them. Like, how does he know our names? The little name tents right by there, you know. In the perfect age order. And by the end of the night, he revealed himself to his brothers. And at this time, you might be thinking, because you've watched a few Rambo movies, right? He's going to lay waste to them and their entire households, right? He's going to get vengeance because of what they did to him, right? 
That's what modern movies do, you know? You take from me, I get back at you. That's all we see over and over and over. But in God's story, here's what Joseph comes with. Look at the scripture, verse 5 in chapter 45. He tells his brothers, after crying and weeping with them, but don't be angry with yourselves that you did this to me, for God did it. He sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. And they bowed down to him, just like in his dream, just like what he knew. But only this time, he wasn't the arrogant little snotty-nosed 17-year-old. He was a humble man who knew that God could be trusted, that even though it looked like God was absent, he wasn't. He was silent, but he still served him because he knew God was good and he's with me. And the question I have for you today is, what if? What what, what would I do today if I were absolutely confident that God was good and that he was with me? What would I do today? Because he is. So after that story, I think A to Z, you know. Where do you find yourself? And I felt like, after putting this together, that might be some of you find, you're finding yourself in a, in a great deal of pain or sometimes you just want to know what to do next. You don't know, man. You're kind of stuck. You're not seeing the dream. Or maybe you need a new dream. I don't know. But I, I think during this last song, if you're new to our church, we have these benches. They're kind of like altars. We call them altars. And up in the balcony as well. And sometimes in a sermon like this, God will be working in your heart just for you. You'll say, man, he's talking to me. But that's the Holy Spirit of God. And for you, the next step for you to, to be humble yourself, to come and kneel at an altar of prayer and say, God, I need your help here. It may be you need to receive Jesus as your Savior and go on down the road with him. I'm not sure what it is, but if you need to pray today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you'll just stand with me and bow your heads. Our band's going to come and play a song. But I think before they play anything, I just need you to soak in this moment. And if you believe it, Lord, you just say, Lord, I'm with you. And I know you're with me. I know you're good. But I need to pray about some things and I need to come humble myself before you so that you can work in my life and do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come? If you, if you feel, if you feel that your heart beating, this is not so I can, this is just for you. This is your moment. Just nail it down with God. Get real with him and tell him where you're at. He, he, knows, he knows you. If you just need to pray, come on, pray.